Okay, we're talking about damage, the different types of damage you're supposed to know about. We had brinilling, indications from balls. Uh, flaking, <laughs> breaking loose of material. Fretting, we talked about fretting yesterday, which is what? The microscopic, microscopic movement. Microscopic movement. Uh, <clears throat> a condition of surface erosion, that's a big deal. Condition of surface erosion means material is now missing and it shouldn't be caused by minute movement between two parts. Usually clamped together with a lot of pressure these parts are. Well, kind of loses the pressure. That's why it starts going back and forth. Uh, galling. I know. Like the old Germans? That's what I was saying. Gall. The Gauls. Oh, they're the French. Yeah. A severe condition of chafing or fretting. So why don't we just call it fretting? Uh, which is a transfer of metal from one part to another. So galling. A uh, severe condition. A severe condition of chafing or fretting. Um, uh, which a transfer of metal from one part to another occurs. Um, which a transfer of metal occurs. Where would that likely to happen? I hadn't thought about that. Stainless or covers, or bearings like crank bearings? Cam lobes and lifters. So you know when they say like a like you know, like what Duke's saying, I think when like the stainless is or like a or, uh, it's like aluminum and steel or something like they have a gall they gall a screw like Oh yeah, yep, yep. Is that the okay, same I got thing? you now. You know, why not? I don't see why it wouldn't be. Like aluminum in aluminum. That's yeah. where it's really going to happen. Yes, that's gall threads. So you take dry aluminum, and especially if it's like a pipe fitting, and you try to screw it into an aluminum, you'll get transfer of metal from one end and it'll weld up. Yeah, exactly. That was a good one, Duke. <laughs> Let's see. It is usually caused by slight movement of mated parts having limited relative motion under high loads. I don't know about that. Um, gouging. It's funny. Most of these things are like you apply to people, right? <laughs> I don't know about Bernelling, but you had flaky people, um, personalities. You know, you fret about something, which means you nervous. You worry about it. You're fretting, um, galling. They say about people. You know, well, that's just the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Be, um, Oh yeah, or, or you're yeah you say, oh, he's a very galling person, yeah. which means <laughs> he, I guess you guys kind of have a lot of vanillaing though. Yeah, a lot of uh, gouging. <laughs> we, can, we can throw that in there, right? <laughs> I don't like the definition, the written definition, but you should know what gouging is. You take a gouge of something; it's like a piece is missing, right? It's, Gouge. So, um, what do I have here? A, fur a furrowing condition. Well, okay. So, you know what a furrow is? Yeah, yeah, like if you're a, a farmer, yeah. it's a furrow. It's yeah, a the, you, you, the, under the bed. The, the plow. Yeah, it's a plowed thing. It's the deep part. So, so a gouging. I just describe it. What's well, a gouge? So, <laughs> it's a cut. Okay. So, um, what does I say? A furrowing condition. I'm going to go with it. If you are R O W I, a furrowing condition. Um, displacement of metal. It just sounds like everything we just talked about. Everything just sounds like a variation of each other. It really does. And that's why, I, you know, they come up with all these things and I just, oh, I don't know. I tend to just lump them into one. You know, I don't have... Yeah.
You've got you got your fretting, you got your gouging, and has a <laughs> uh, let's see six pitting. Okay, pitting's a real one. <laughs> They're all real, but pitting. What is pitting? That's an easy one. Corrosion. Yeah, corrosion. Um, small. Uh, yeah, again, the definitions are like. Um, Small hollows of irregular shape in the surface, usually caused by corrosion or minute mechanical chipping of surfaces. Pitting, so corrosion. So if you like last speed of the Oh, that was good. Small craters. Did I spell that right? Crater, C-R. Craters? No, it's probably C-R-8. Crate. Crate, C-R-8. C-R-A-T-E-R-S. Yeah, A-T-E-R-S. You glass beat aluminum parts, you can pit it. Yep, exactly. Glass beating aluminum parts. Cause pitting. And you'll love this one. Last one. Scoring. Again, people. Hey, I scored last night. Um, oh, you went to a soccer game. Yeah. Um, a series of deep scratches caused by foreign particles. It is, but it's scoring. So a series of... Deep scratches uh, caused by foreign particles. Caused. Oops. Doesn't have to be. Yep. Caused by uh, foreign particles. So yes, Nick had some good ones. You have cylinder walls get scored, bearings get scored. What else? Oil pump housing. Oil pump housings get scored. That's true. So what do you do if you don't know what it's called? You know, you got all these things, and and you see it. it's got this like big metal's gone. Big scrapey part where metal's gone. You're like, well, I don't know if it's flaking or fretting or galling or gouging or pitting or scoring. Damage. Yeah. Damage. You got some damage there. What kind of damage? Bad damage. That's what kind of damage. <laughs> <clears throat> Rejectable damage. <clears throat> All right. I think we're good with that. Now we can move on. All right, let's talk about the engine itself. Did I make the thing go yet? Yes, I did. All right, let's talk about the engine. All right, we talk about the crankcase. There's a crankcase right here. I may have to bring in my little stand so I can show you. Hang on. Two students standing in front of the whole time. Just crank. Yeah, look at that. All right, let's talk about the crankcase. Let me see. Is there anything else I want to talk about before we move into the crankcase? Because I think there was. All right, we did, looked at all that. We. Well, that just locked up. Okay, looked at that. We talked about that. What are we doing there? Checking? Run out. Run out. All right. <laughs> Oh yeah, might as well talk about this since I threw this in here. All right, so I talked to you about just throwing your parts in a bucket, boom, yes. right? As opposed to, ooh, this little one came from this one spot right here and you mark it with the tape and stuff like that. Um, something I learned, I mean, when I was a little kid and I worked in the body shop, you know, our time, every second counted. And that's the way I was told, you just take a car apart, you got damage, you just take all the nuts and bolts and boom, we threw them, you know, one gallon paint can. And then when it came time to put it together, we'd lay everything out like this. And then you'd know what size, you know, bolts. Well, so I got into that habit. So this was at Lycoming School. And did I tell you the story already? So. It was kind of funny because in Lycoming School, let me see. There we go. Got all these guys right here. That's me and my lab coat. They made fun of my lab coat on the first day. On the second day, they all whispered in my ear, did you get that around here somewhere? I'm like, no, I brought it with me. Oh. <laughs> We wish we had one. Anyway, so you can see we've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five tables or something set up there. And, you, of course, you know, as people are, we're all competitive. And it was a race to see who could get their engine apart first and back together first, you know. So everybody gets their engine apart. And, of course, I just threw all my stuff in a bucket. And I was done taking my engine apart first. And everybody snickered at me. And then when it came time to put it back together... Everybody went to it. They got all their little stuff in the right baggie and this and that, and there I am. Dump out everything, and I set up all my little nuts, bolts, and screws like nice little soldiers. 
these are all the same and those are the same and it takes a little while to do it and I counted them all made sure I had everything I needed meanwhile they're going and ripping and tearing and getting their engine apart and uh, pretty soon they look over and my engine's done <laughs> and they're still working on it why because when it got down to the end there are eight bolts here that are longer and those are intake bolts and I knew that and there's only eight of them well they couldn't find their eight bolts because they were stuck in a sump or a crankcase or something and so I finished an hour before them because they trusted the people before them so I guess that's my point take the time lay stuff out it's worth it you're working on a very expensive piece of equipment you want to know where everything is what you're missing before you start <clears throat> because when you get near the end if something's not in the right spot you have to know it so start at the beginning and put everything in the right spot to begin with Look at the parts catalog. What size bolt goes there? If you don't have the right one, go get the right bolt because eventually it's going to catch up to you. The other thing is when you start working on an engine, you guys are working on your engine, you're putting it together. Imagine you will if you grabbed a whole bunch of these little nuts right there and you walk over to the do something and you bump it and you drop a couple. Did you drop them all on the floor? Some on the floor and some in the engine. What did you do? You don't know. So what do you have to do at that point? Take the whole engine apart and look. <clears throat> so if you know for a fact that you have eight rod bolts and two, four, eight, eight nuts, and you have all the right stuff. The other thing I would do is like when I would walk up to the engine and I'm going to put washers and lock washers, I would count how many washers I picked up off the table. So I would know I had six in my hand. Walk over here. In case I drop some, I know how many I dropped. I know if they went in the engine. So it's little things like that will really help you. So anyway, I took that picture there because that's just how I like to set things up. You do it any way you want. <clears throat> but things on the bottom right by the uh, vice. Right there? Yeah. Unfortunately, the 235s and the 290s have push rods that, push rod housings that get put in with the cylinder, right? Mm -hmm. All the other light comings, you have these springs hold them in and that's the lock nut for it so put these on put those on you put one of these on screw it down so the push rods go in later so you put the cylinder on tighten all the nuts then put the push rods in it's much much nicer what's that piece right there yeah Ooh, what is this piece right here It's a shaft that drives the tachometer shaft. Okay. I can promise you one of you have already lost yours. I just don't know who yet. <laughs> All right. Oops. I wanted to do that. Okay. Uh, let's see. We did that. Um, You're not walking around <clears throat> grabbing parts off the tables and people are paying attention. Absolutely not. That's that would in my book. That's inexcusable. Okay. But when I find parts laying around in a parts washer or something, <laughs> and you go hide them, no, I hang on to them. Somebody's gonna need it. I think I like this picture because I like everything to be laid out, as you can tell, in a logical sequence. I like my cylinders laid out from left to right, number one, number two, number three, number four, everything next to it when I'm working on it. And I just like, I don't know where I got this picture from. I don't even think I took it, but <clears throat> you can see that everything is laid out logically right next to it, ready for assembly. Try to keep things organized, like things next to each other, not all over the place. Maybe we already talked about that. We talked about cleaning stuff, we talked about that. Uh, now we're gonna talk about crankcases. All right, crankcases. <clears throat> thing I love about crankcase, uh, everybody who writes about crankcases, is they always say the crankcase is like the, because you guys do the reading, right? The body. The rib. rib, body. Well, you got the right idea. The backbone of the engine. Which is funny because, you know, being a mechanic, when I go to the chiropractor and they say something about my spine, I say, spine, it's like your crankcase. <laughs> and I would go, what? Because your spine is nothing like a crankcase. 
So why would a crankcase be like your spine? <clears throat> so don't like that one. Huh? It's what? Being a smart ass. I like that. Go ahead. It's more like a magneto. It's more like a magneto. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Uh, so, but the crankcase is for which everything is, of course, they're implying that it's the frame which everything is built off of. I'm sure you get that. What kind of crankcase is this? Continental. It is a sand continental? Yeah. Permold or sandcast? Sand cast. Sand cast. Oh, no. Permold. 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 Yeah, because it looks like sand. It's not it's sand. Not sand color. All right. Yeah. What color is sandcast one? Not that they're color. They're all the same color. The permold has the integral oh, yeah. alternator up front. The sand cast has it in the back. All right. So crankcase. What kind of crankcase is this? This is a uh, your light combing. Let's see. All right. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right. So crankcase. What is a crankcase? It is the, and I refuse to write like the backbone. So I just wrote, it's the case of the engine. <laughs> case of the engine. Well, it's got a lot of functions if you were to think about it. One, unlike my children, it must support itself. Well, I actually started to write that too. <laughs> I could have said many of you. <clears throat> Has to support itself. It is what attaches to the motor mount, where the motor mount attaches to the airframe. Uh, let's see, there are, we've talked about this before, two types of mounts. I should really say three. This is kind of a light combing thing. Really think about it. Two types of mounts for light combing. We have the straight mount. And anybody remember the other one? Dinosaur. Like oh, right on, dinosaur, dinafocal. Dino What uh, dynafocal, <clears throat> they're angled inwards and downwards. The top ones and the bottom ones are angled inwards and upwards. So that if you put a line going through each one of them, where would all these lines meet? <laughs> right, points to the engine's center of gravity. Let's see, if I wanted to say there's three types, let me see. We look right here on this one. Is that a dynafocal or straight mount? Dynafocal. Yeah, it's pointed towards the engine center line. Uh, dynafocal or straight mount? Uh, yeah, rail. yeah, this one's going to sit on rails. So cot big big continentals, they do not mount in the back like Lycoming. So have four bolts in the back, and that's that's it. Uh, Lycoming doesn't do that. Or sorry, Continental doesn't do that. They're going to have mounts, four mounts coming out down here. One, two, three, on the other side, right about there. Four. I can kind of see it, I think, down in there. Yeah, maybe not. not right, right there, kind of a thing, down below this. And so it's going to sit on a, a bed, a rail. So like my motor mount uh, has four points on the firewall. And then it has metal coming, big tubes coming straight out, and then supports going this way, and then it mounts here and here and there and there. Um, Bonanzas, they don't have a, a, a steel mount, they have, it's part of the airframe. So that would meet your other type of mount. Let me see. Um, what else must the case have and do? Well, it's going to contain the bearings. Contains bearings in which the crank rotates. Which the crank rotates. Um, any ideas here? Uh, hold accessories, or mount accessories. Oh, okay, we'll get that one. Let's see, provide, provide tight enclosure for lubricating oil. which means you're not supposed to have oil leaks. And when you get an oil leak, you're supposed to fix it to a point. And then, 
and then your idea supports various internal and external components. of the power plant. That could be everything from a internal, we have oil pumps, <coughs> gears of course, external, all the accessory drives, magnetos, alternators, generators, governors, turbochargers, turbochargers vacuum pumps, hydraulic pumps, um, Oh, we got most of them. Um, oh, I already said this. Provides mounting attachments to airframe. To airframe. And obviously it's going to provide mounting and supports for where the cylinders are attached. All right, what's it made out of? Aluminum. Aluminum. No, there are no magnesium. Aluminum casting. And then, so aluminum casting, there's the sand cast, which most things are. As the name implies, you make the little mold out of sand and you pour the molten metal in there. So the sand cast is rougher. And you, and you, will, you will appreciate this, I hope. Um, at Lycoming School, they talked about the roughness. And as I often say, if, if you, it seems like if you can't make the product really nice, you explain why it's made the way it is and you come up with a reason. So. Why do you think Lycoming says, oh, no, the roughness is good? So oil retention? Oh, that would be a good one. They didn't do that, though. Turbulent airflow? Well, turb what do you mean? Why do you want turbulent like airflow? Versus laminar airflow, you want it to, you know. It's not a wing. Stronger. <laughs> you talk about the intake and stuff, how it's like that. Like, well, on a microscopic level. Heat displacement? Yeah. So, you know, if we had something very smooth, it would look like that. But on a microscopic level, it would look like this. What does that remind you of? Cooling fins. Cooling fins, of course. All that roughness creates little bumps, which are little tiny cooling fins. So helps dissipate heat. Well, if that was the reason, they would have just put cooling fins on the engine. <laughs> well, they don't have to because it's so rough. Yeah. Why are they on the cylinders? And we have the per mold. Um, also called an investment cast, I believe, investment casting, which I kind of wanted to really get into this, this, what the difference was, and I thought, oh, there's a really easy way to explain it. it there's not. And I don't want to say it wrong, but investment casting, it was really weird. It uses a, uh, I just watched the whole video on it, um, like a ceramic, I want to say. It was a wax coating and stuff. It was, it was kind of cool. It made it sound like, Like the mold is reusable, but in a way it wasn't. It's just a way of doing it that's it's supposed to be much better. It's almost like they surround the <clears throat> plaster of Paris and dump the molten. Yeah, I forget. It's been a while. Apart. Yeah, since I've watched it, it's been a while. But anyway, that's the thing you have to know, though, is just when you're talking with Continentals, it's the sand cat versus permal. And it just comes down to it'd be easier if they said, does it have an integral alternator or not? And you could say, oh, no, it's got an alternator on the back. And they say, okay. But they want to be cool, and they want to say, do you have a sandcast or permalt? So um, sandcast has a rear. Oh, from, anyway, Continental does. Continental has a rear belt-driven alternator. And the permold for Continental, because uh, Lycoming doesn't do a permold that I'm aware of, uh, Continental has um, integral 
alternator, that front one. <clears throat> That's the important thing to gain from it? That's it. That really is. Yeah. Other than the roughness is there for cooling, so don't sand it flat. <laughs> When, um, uh, uh, what do you call that stuff? The painting with the electrostatic charge, the powder coating. When powder for coating first came out, it was a big deal for engine shops to offer powder coating until the FAA came out and said, ah, you can't do that. Because powder coating, I don't know a lot about it, but it's done at higher heats. And what's the hottest you're supposed to get aluminum without losing its heat treatment properties? Yeah, powder coating is like 450, I think, is what they say. Okay, like, thank you. It's like between 375 and... Boiling. Boiling, yeah. Boiling. 212. Oh. 212. <clears throat> You're not supposed to go with 212. So the FAA came out and said, I don't be doing that. So, all right. Um, the crankcase is in multiple sections. Well, if it's an opposed, you have two sections. They are non-interchangeable. <clears throat> They're match set. So don't call up somebody asking for a left hand <laughs> O290 crankcase. <clears throat> Not gonna get it, it won't work out. Um, but what about radial engines? Hold on. Radial, they'll have three to seven sections. Depends on how big the radial is, how many, what type it is. Um, you usually have the front or nose, front or the nose section. Um, this usually has thrust bearing, by usually I think always. What do I mean by thrust bearing? If it takes side view <clears throat> modes, the front where the crankshaft wants to go forward. Okay, well, it always wants to go forward. So you're right. It stops it. <clears throat> it's the part of the crankcase that holds the. Well, you got to think about what's happening with the crankshaft on any engine. What's mounted here? Prop, this was not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> props mounted here, so the props trying to go forward, that way. forward uh, up the way I've got it. Should I just have you stand here and hold it for a while? Sure. All right, so it's trying to go forward. And so it's going forward. And what's it got to go forward against? The crankcase. So crank 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 in this case, in an opposed, this is the thrust bearing surface here. On the crank, and then in your engine, Lycoming doesn't use a replaceable thrust bearing. Just as an oil film, push against the crankcase. Well, in a radial engine, it doesn't do that. They use a giant ball bearing. So the radial engine crankshaft attaches to a big ball bearing, which then sits in a crankcase, and then that's the thrust bearing. The thing that carries the airplane forward. Uh, we have the main section. Or the power section, as it's called. Power section. Um, I said one or two piece construction. I can't think of many one piece. I'll put it. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I think. I, yeah, okay. One or two piece. I think I thought of one. Uh, so you have the power section. That's where the cylinders are going to attach. After the power section, you'd have possibly blower or diffuser section. Not all engines are going to have that. The Lycoming and Pratt Whitney's and Updo, the Continental doesn't. Um, and then the accessory section. So you're going to have many sections. Let me see, I think I got some photos here. Here's my radio. There we go, radial. So front section's going to have the thrust bearing goes right in there. 
thrust bearing goes there. So we have the main, no, or sorry, the nose section, thrust bearing. Then we have the power section, power section which could be one. how many pieces is this one? Two. Two. You can see the split right there. Then following that is the diffuser. blower diffuser. What's the difference between a blower and diffuser? Diffuser is just a naturally aspirated. No. 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 Blower blows and diffuser diffuses. He's not wrong. Easiest way to see, if you guys haven't looked at the 13, what the hell is that one? 1320? Double I know, but there's, I call it by the, 20, the 2800, thank you, I knew I was wrong. 2800, the twin row radio with the, we had it running today, it just plugs in, you're welcome to plug it anytime you want, just don't stick your fingers in it unless I get to watch you lose one. Because <laughs> <clears throat> I have to fill out the incident report, so I might as well enjoy it. So, um, anyway, it, the, you know, the propeller spins about that fast. But it's got a blower on it, a centrifugal uh, blower on it, which you'll learn more about with Phil's class. You cannot, it spins so fast that you don't, I mean, it's just a blur. That's how fast that's spinning when the prop is going this fast. So imagine how fast that thing really spins. So what it does, it takes air um, in the center and blows it out. It's a compressor, centrifugal compressor. Uh, a diffuser would be that exact same thing turned slower so it doesn't boost it. So the Lycomings have a centrifugal diffuser, not a blower. If you sped it up, it'd be a blower. And then what comes behind that? Way back here. Accessories. 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 So does that diffuser just put it at normal? Op or, uh, yes. No, it makes it naturally aspirated, or, normally aspirated. Or you, you talked earlier last week about, I forgot, normalizing. That, what was the, what was the Turbo normalizing. Yeah. And okay. So is that what a diffuser? No, works? diffuser... Just like the name implies, it diffuses the fuel air mixture in an even amount. So I don't know the answer to this necessarily, but compare two engines side by side of the same era. Continental had the seven cylinder and Lycoming has the nine cylinder. And they're both about, the, they're interchangeable on the airplanes they actually used them on. And so the seven cylinder does not have a diffuser. It's a smaller core, fewer cylinders. Nine cylinder is a little bit bigger. Cylinders are the same cubic inch displacement, but they used a wheel in there so that fuel and air would come in here and it would spray it out to the sides where it got picked up from the intake tubes and into cylinders. So it appears that when you get into nine cylinders, that if you simply let the carburetor on the bottom, let air come into a plenum chamber or an intake manifold and go to each cylinder on its own, some cylinders will be much richer and some will be much leaner. But if you bring it into a diffuser, which is a blower that's not spinning fast enough to actually boost the air pressure, it just distributes everything nicely in an even fashion. Yeah. I want to say that blower is like um, 20 to 1. Well, don't say that. He wants to say it. but 20 to 1? Probably, yeah. I think it says on the data plate. I have no idea. Yes. I can read. Um, so you mentioned that there's uh, three sections uh, or not. It, a radial engine is made of three to seven sections, but we cover four sections, which is the front nose, the car. That's three to seven. Hey, one, two, three, four, five on this one. Mm -hmm. What if I had another row of radio uh, of cylinders? There's seven. Six, seven. I know, but uh, we covered front, main, blower, and then yes. accessory. That's four sections, so how would it have three? That's there. Oh, how would it have three? Smaller engine. So how about a nose case, mm -hmm. a one-piece power section, and then an accessory case on the back? That's three. It wouldn't have a blower or anything? Nope. Okay. I just told you, the Continental does not have a blower. Oh. But I think it, that one has four sections because it does have a, pretty sure it has a uh, split case there. Looks like a C line. Yeah. Looks like what? C line. So some you have a blower. Some of them do not have blower diffuser section. So when you go across the street, you look at our lab, have the Continental, then a Lycoming, then the 2800. And so Lyco the Continental is a small one, seven cylinders, does not have a diffuser. Next one does. Next one does. All right. Uh, let's see. Going back to my opposed. Opposed. They use through bolts. Use through bolts. Use through bolts. Um, 
I will say there's two types. And this, this would go for both continental lake homing. Two types. I would put them into fixed and floating. You have experienced the fixed. They don't come out. They're anchored in place. So you, there's a hidden set of threads you can't see. So you have threads you can see, threads you can't see inside of here, and threads there, right? That's three sets. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. So they are screwed in. And I've never taken one of these out that I can ever remember. You just, you don't in the field. It's not something we just need to do. But a lot of the other engines, new engines, most Continentals, newer Lycomings, all of these bolts are floaters. So they're not, there's only two sets of threads, one here and one there. So when you have the engine up on the stand and you're taking it apart, you just knock these out. Just tap them with a hammer, get a little brass punch, all the way through. Have all six of them laying on the table. Boom. And then the case just comes apart. So you knock those out. Now they are dowled. They are dowled. So where it got thicker right here, these are dowels. It's that size for a reason. And that size corresponds to the carefully drilled hole in the other one so that when it comes together, this lines up the case. So you don't have the case sagging or forward or aft or something like that. So they're dowled. They're, they're very special. That's why the last little bit, you have to kind of crank it together because it's an interference fit. On the ones with bolts that are floaters, same thing. They're just dowled. It lines up the case. That's it. <laughs> nope, that's it. Um, I don't think I wrote this in my notes, but I will tell you. I told you in class, in lab, that there's really three types of light combing cases then across the board. You have the type you have that has fixed through bolts that you can tap apart. You have the fixed that you have to press apart. And then you have the floaters, which tap apart. So if you have that middle one in there that has the press fit, I think I passed it up. You must use the ST1222-2 crate case plate studs. Mind you, this slide is probably now five to six years old. So, yeah, probably easily six, if you could find them. It probably says no, you know, no stock. FAA trace. You don't need that on tools. It's a little hard to explain. But what it is, you have these very long studs right here that actually screw over these, these through bolts here, right? So it makes these longer. And then you put the plates on, and the plates press against these right here. There's no corresponding holes. It's a flat spot here on these. And so you have your other ones where they're longer. And so as you start, you put the plates on, just like it shows with this nut. So you tighten this, this stud right here. And then you start cranking down on this nut where that nut presses on the plate right here, 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 and here are where the other studs are. And it pushes on those studs just like where you tapped on it. This presses on it. You can't tap the other ones apart. Yeah. Found the complete tool set for the fourteen thousand euros, <laughs> so about fifteen thousand dollars. Depends on the exchange rate. Twelve thousand. Hey, it would have dealed. Let's go. I know. We should buy a couple of them. <laughs> and without these, you're not getting the case apart. He like said, I, "I mentioned, you know, in my shop, we had these tools, and." Very smart people who were smart enough to take on overhauling their own engine, you know, putting their own life on the line, like, I can handle this, would come into the shop with just screwdrivers and pry bars and look like a porcupine all the way around. Just, dude, we can't get this apart, man. What's your trick? I'm like, well, the trick is don't do that. You just ruined your cases. 
So we have to have them surface and line board, but you know, I can get them apart for you with the right tool. We'll press them apart and then set them out for surface and line board. And that just cost you, back then it was two grand just to do that, so. Oh man, how much is that tool? Five grand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The plate itself is like almost $13,000. Yeah, you, it's not like you couldn't make this. Yeah, you know, it's just, it seems like I don't need to get a the plate is not a big deal. I mean, with modern equipment, I mean, shoot, you could see and see that thing in, in an hour. Um, the hard part, believe it or not, I think it would be making these stud extenders. That's all. It's got internal and external threads. I think that would be the hardest part. Um, huh? It's doable. It's completely doable. Like, if you walked into a machine shop and said, Look, man, this thing's gonna cost me twelve thousand. I'll give you six. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you want that the end of the day? I was gonna quote you two hundred bucks a minute ago, but okay. All right, let's talk about sealants. How to sealants, or how to screw up a perfectly good engine. All right, what did I talk about damage that goes on right here? Fretting. Fretting. fretting, and fretting is caused from? Who caused it? You. No, I didn't. Mechanic damage, oh, I guarantee the Lord didn't. So it's mechanic induced damage. It's by not putting the engine together correctly. It's not hard to do this. It's just, it's one of those, you don't know what you don't know. And so you just do something stupid and that's what you end up with. So for crankcase sealant, there are new products available. This is a Loctite 515, if I'm not mistaken, an anaerobic sealer that is now used on both Lycoming and Continentals. Lycoming has, I'm sorry, Continental has some crazy ass formula where you put this material on one side of the case and you put a completely different product from a different manufacturer on the other side of the case and you put the two together. How they came up with that, I don't know. But I remember talking to a very seasoned mechanic and I said, you know that's two different products and you put them on one. Like, no way. I mean, the guy was so smart, he had me doubting myself after building engines for years. I had to go to the book, I'm like, okay, thank God I was right. Um, so it's what you don't know. Anyway, I don't, on light combings, I didn't use this, uh, this sealer. I went a little bit more old school. I like the old school. Old school is where you use this stuff here, a POB or plyo bond, and you guys will be doing it this way. And so both light combing and continental, um, well, I should say continental uses, sorry, the red stuff on one side, this brown stuff off on another, and silk thread on the Continentals. Silk thread? Silk thread. Oh, they put like a thread in between there? Yes. What do you mean that? Is that what that is? Yeah, and, this is, and so Lycoming gives you the option of either just the red stuff or the POB and silk thread. This is, in fact, the silk thread. It is not the same silk thread. Everybody thinks silk thread is the same. Continental says you will use Continental part number 64 whatever silk thread. Lycoming says buy a double lot silk thread. So where can you buy your double lot silk thread? Okay. Hobby <laughs> Lobby. As long as it says double lot on the back. And Continental, where do you buy their stuff? The far Continental. Oh, but surely it's the same thread, right? It is not because I went and got the double lot thread at Hobby Lobby or online or Amazon and that it called for. And we have the Continental by part number and a measure of the micrometer. One is twice as thick as the other. The uh, double lot is much thinner, much, oh. much thinner. So All right. So it's single lot. lot. <laughs> but no, the double lot is the smaller stuff. Continental is bigger. So the same. So yes. Oh, bigger be double lot. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, quad lot. Okay. So what happens here is you get this, well, string is string. In fact, when I took over this class and I'm like, okay, where's my double lot silk thread? 
and the tool room guy handed me this rope. I mean, it was literally, I mean, you could see it's triple-stranded sewing thread of some sort for a heavy canvas. You can't use this. It's sealant. Well, what happens if I use something that is too fat? <laughs> then the case didn't go together. And if the case didn't go together, what happened to the bearings? Well, the bearings aren't going to match together. By the way, I didn't point this out. I told you about all the fretting right here. There's a little bit of, you know the tang, right? The tang is the little cutout. Notice on the other side that there's a nice indent from the tang from the other bearing because it's spun into it. Oh, that's what happens with fretting. You have movement in there. So that's the other thing you see all the time is, I think this one looked nice, but you'll see the tang damage right over, well, I'd actually be right here, I think, on this one. So anyway, long story, use the right thread. So you do POB. This is just something I saw on the internet. This is not well done. I would not accept this. Number one, run your brown stuff into here by about half an inch so that it tacks and holds this string down. Also separate the string. If you don't have two pieces of string, then you've got them like this and you've got quad ot string. So separate. Lycoming does a poor job of saying, run the string so that the strings are on both sides of the bolts, something like that. What they mean is it should be on this, not this side and this side, but see how it's on this side and then it comes around this way and then now it's on this side. That is both sides. Okay. So they're together, but they go all over the place. Yes. And then when you are, so it's going to go all the way around, and you're going to come right over here, do the same thing. Run it around the end by about just a half an inch. The longer you make it, the better chance you have of grabbing it and unpeeling it. And then you got to start all over again. Then when you get all done, and there is a picture in the manual that shows you exactly how it should go, you take a step back and you say, all right, I'm a bit of oil. I'm a drop of oil, and do I make it out of the engine? Let's see. I wanted a pen. There we go. So, what the, come on. I just want the pen. There's the pen. Select that. Oops, did I do the right thing? Pen, pen. All right, I got the pen. A little bit of oil. All right, sorry, it's big. Can the oil get to that hole? Yes, it can, but that hole goes into the accessory case, so it's okay. Can it go out that hole, that hole, that hole, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. I'll make it bigger again. Okay, was it okay here? Yes, yes it is. The silk thread's up there, so it's going to come in here and drain into the accessory case. How about here? Yeah, it's down below, except I think they actually crossed it right here. I think it goes over and down. This one crossed it, so that's terrible. But assuming it's not, eh, maybe it's not. It's fine. This okay? Okay, this one is fine, except they shouldn't have put this, the plyo bond this close to the bearing board because it's going to seep into here and cause problems. So keep a clean spot right there. This one okay? Oil can't make it past the string. Can't make it past the string. Can't make it past the string, except for what they do here? Close. Too close. close. Plyo bond's too close. Are we safe here? Yes. No. No. Nope. Straight to the outside? Straight to the outside. So the engine's going to leak real well. So that, that seems like it's really awfully difficult to get that plyo bond not close to the edge of the main main journals there. You're correct. It's hard. I mean, and how close do you to? get? What's your, what's your, what are you saying, like? Sixteenth. A sixteenth of an inch? Yeah, just not up to, but just try and leave a little bit. It's not going to, like, cause some catastrophic damage, but just when you have room, you take the advantage. What, what do you do to put that string down? It's a procedure. So... First of all, don't use it off the roll. Don't try and leave it connected to the, you gotta take, measure it out, cut it, break it off. And that way, cause it's gonna kind of twist as you go. And so you put this plyo bond on and it gets tacky. And so then you just start, you just kind of tap it as you go. And you get it on your finger and it's nasty. I'll show you guys when you get ready to do it. And then of course it's gonna go down here as well. <coughs> looks like they got all the holes this time. It does, yeah. Well, usually because one guy does this side and one guy does that side over there. So we're going to make sure we do that correctly. So that was uh, sealant. So that's a big deal. Wrong sealant, you, you're going to get 
you're going to get fretting. And then yesterday, right before we left, somebody asked, well, and I gave you the scenario how somebody else, you know, didn't use the right sealant string. They didn't use wet torque. They didn't use the right product to do the torque. So the torque wasn't enough. You got fretting in there and then the fretting happens. So now the bearings got a little bit of play in there because you've lost material at the saddle, right? Remember the scenario? And then you come along unsuspecting, you take off cylinders, you put them on, you do everything absolutely correctly. And it clamps it down now where that fretting material is missing. So it clamps the bearing down onto the crankshaft. Yep. And so now you don't have the proper clearance. And you said, well, now what? <laughs> Right? Yeah, well, now what is, yeah, it could happen. You could seize up a bearing on that, or you could have a catastrophic engine failure that happened to you. So that's unfortunate. And I swear to you, once upon a time, and I cannot find it, but I remember it because this guy I worked for, he wouldn't let me throw out any service bulletins. No matter how, you know, we get them, oh, this one's superseded, throw it out. Goes, Don't you throw out any service bulletins. And uh, God love him for that because somewhere in that book, was a service bulletin by Lycoming, and I can see the pictures in my head. And what they had you do before you took cylinders off was to take all of the spark plugs out so the engine would turn over free and have you put the propeller horizontal and take a shot bag, like a five pound shot bag, and move it down the propeller until the propeller moved. And then you marked where that happened. And then when you replace the cylinders, it had to be the same thing. Making sure it's not making sure that the prop moved with the same amount of force but they superseded it and pulled it out so i cannot find it it would have been something like from the 60s or 70s so all right it is